The Old Testament lesson for this fourth Sunday in Lent is recorded in the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter we pick up at the fourth verse. And just bear in mind, the Israelites have been out of Egypt now for a couple months. Think of all that they've seen and witnessed, the ten plagues, the um, the hand of God working in the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, the parting of the Red Sea. They have been on the receiving end of miracles like manna and quail and water from the rock. So think of all that God has been doing for them, and then they still complain. And we're going to talk about this in the sermon, the fact that um, can you say you are this faithful Christian and yet have fruits that contradict this? So, you know, there's a reason this was appointed for Lent, guys. So let's hear the word of the Lord. Now, from Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go round the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of John, the third chapter. We pick up at the 14th verse. And remember, Jesus is speaking this to Nicodemus, who really truly thought, you know, he was a member of the religious elite. They were the best of the best, right? Nicodemus comes to him under the cover of darkness. And so Jesus is talking with him about, look, man, things, you, things are not what you think they are. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And we all know that there is nothing new under the sun. God is very clear on this, and nobody disputes this. But wow, it's almost scary how much overlap there is between the Old Testament Israelites and us today. You hear it, right? We have no bread, and we hate the bread we have. That right there is a sermon for 21st century America. Well, before you get ahead of yourself here, ask yourself, why did God send those fiery serpents? More importantly, did God send those fiery serpents simply to destroy the wicked people, the complainers? In a word, no. God sent those fiery serpents in order to wake those foolish sinners up from their sinful stupor. God sent those fiery serpents in order to bring about repentance. See, he didn't desire their deaths any more than he desires the death of any man. He desired that all of them would turn and live. And we say, well, it, it worked, you know, sort of. Those folks woke up real quick, didn't they? You know, the snakes start biting and they say, well, we've sinned. Pray to the Lord that he would take these serpents away from us. Kind of sounds familiar. So Moses prays. And these same sorts of prayers have been offered up with great fervor these past several months, haven't they? You know, Lord, take this from us. But what was God's response to Moses' prayer? Well, the answer is uh, 
not what the people expected or wanted. Now, to be sure, God heard their cries. He answered their prayers. He just, he just didn't do it the way that they wanted or expected. See, these, these rubes, in their selfish panic, they were looking no further than that one single symptom of sin that was manifesting itself in their daily lives. And, and that's really what it was. That's what those serpents were. They, it was a single symptom of sin. And they wanted that one single symptom to immediately be treated and done away with so that they could immediately go back to normal. The good physician, on the other hand, well, he desired to treat the root cause of the infection that was killing them. He desired to treat the sin and not just that one single symptom of sin. So, rather than take away all the serpents, you know, rather than take away that one single thing that was causing them all that fear and sorrow and tribulation, like they wanted, and which I'll tell you is kind of baffling to me. It reveals their true ignorance to the sin that was around them all the time. It's like, oh my God, it's so terrible now. Things have always been terrible and scary. But anyway, rather than take away that one single thing that was causing them great fear, God instead instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent and erect that statuary in the midst of the camp so that everyone could see it. See, God never promised that you wouldn't be bitten. Rather, what he says is, everyone, when they are bitten, when they look to that bronze serpent, they will live. And as we're told, whenever somebody was bitten, when they did look to that bronze serpent, they lived. Now, there are a lot more other things that could be said here, guys. We, we almost don't have enough time in the day. We could certainly spend a great deal of time talking about the fact that that serpent statue didn't have any magical powers in and of itself. I mean, when you get down to it, it was just a plain old bronze statue. When those people looked to that bronze serpent for life, just as they were instructed by God to do, they weren't looking upon a thing per se, okay? Uh, they weren't looking upon a mere bronze statue for their deliverance. They were actually looking in faith upon the word and promise of God. Word and promise that he himself had attached to that bronze statue. Their looking was the action of faith. It was the action of faith that was reaching out and holding fast to God's word and promise. And pay attention to how God does this. Okay, He specifically attaches his word and promise of life to the foulest, most offensive, most terrifying thing in their lives. He specifically instructed Moses to construct a, a bronze fiery serpent, okay, the very personification of pain and suffering and death. It'd be no different than erecting a bronze statue of a COVID germ today. The last thing I'm sure that any of these folks wanted to look at was another deadly snake towering over them on a pole in their midst. Yet it was to that image of pain and death, the image that Beheld, that was beheld with physical eyes. It was to that image of pain and death that our Lord attached his promise of life and deliverance. Okay, that was something only the eyes of faith would be able to recognize and embrace. Again, the gift of life wasn't in the bronze, nor was it in the people. It was in the word and promise of God. Sounds a little sacramental-ish, doesn't it? What I mean by that is you have God's command do this. You also have God's promise, and you will live. So you have the command, and you have the promise, and it's all attached to something real and tangible, the bronze serpent. Uh, Sacramental-ish. Now, there's also the fact that, um, we, this is important, the people's act of looking didn't contribute to their salvation, okay? As, as if God was going to provide 90% of the deliverance, but the people had to chip in their 10%. They had to look in order to make the uh, equation complete. Well, that's not how it works. That's not how it ever works. I mean, that's nothing more than works righteousness. You know, God does his part, but I need to do mine too. No, that's not it. Life was 100% theirs, solely because of God's gracious word and promise. Their act of looking on that bronze serpent, it didn't contribute to their salvation. No, that was just a faithful response to God's gracious word and promise. Huh. But they did need to look, didn't they? There's the rub for today. They did need to look. 
You know, what if, for whatever reason, what if they didn't look? Like it or not, it's impossible. It was impossible for them to say that they loved God and fully believed God, fully believed his word, and yet still not look. Actions speak louder than words. It gets, oh, Lord, I believe, but don't work that way. Either you believe or you don't. I mean, if you believe, you'll bear the fruits of belief, won't you? If you believe, you'll trust him, you'll listen, you'll obey, and you will look right where he tells you to look. Either you trust God as your Lord or you have a different God, a God who's lording over you and calling the shots. Now, again, to be sure, you don't believe because you've seen. I mean, that's not faith at all. That's like doubting Thomas, right? That's not faith. But you better believe that the act of seeing, that is an act of believing. The, the, the act of seeing is an act of faith. You see or you look because you believe. Looking or seeing, that's the fruit of faith. So again, like it or not, and I know a lot of people don't like this, it was utterly impossible to have life without humbling yourself and listening to God, holding fast to Him and His Word. It was utterly impossible to have life without fixing your gaze upon the bronze serpent in faith, faith that God would keep His Word and grant you life. So now, here we are, 21st century. I mean, in terms of overlap, do you see your need for repentance here? More to the point, do you see how the actions or the fruits of repentant faith are at work here? It's one thing to say that, that we're repentant, we love Jesus, we trust in Jesus. It's quite another thing, though, to actually bear those fruits that are in keeping with repentance. Many, many Christians talk the talk, but how many actually walk the walk? Actions do speak louder than words. And this is why I love the fact that the gospel lesson for today is paired with the bronze serpent account for this particular Sunday in this penitential Lenten season. Again, actions speak louder than words. All too often, we, we tune out, right? We hear the words of John 3.16 in the gospel lesson, and we really don't hear anything else. It's like we're just right back in VBS. We never think of John 3.16 in relation to the Lenten season, do we? Now, folks, why did God send his only begotten son to the world? Now, most people will give you that generic VBS answer and say, well, because he loves us, right? God so loved the world. You're right. But what does that mean? You look at verses 14 and 15. God loved us so much in our sin. He loved us so much in spite of us that he sent his one and only son to be lifted up on a cross to die for our sins so that we could have the free gift of life. I mean, Jesus tells us exactly what this all means, right? He says, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up so that all who look at him will live. Guys, if Jesus himself says that he is the greater bronze serpent, he is lifted up on his cross so that all may live, well then what does that tell you about your sinful condition? You're not just battling snakes or COVID germs. Okay? What does that tell you about the good physician's diagnosis of your reality? God's actions bespeak his word and promise, don't they? God not only tells us that he loves us, he proves it. He shows it. The cross is proof. And as I say all the time, repentance, in the original Greek, repentance carries with it a, a meaning of like a, a 100 degree, uh, 180 degree about face. You know, um, you turn back to God from whatever sinful direction you were headed. You can't go in two directions at the same time, guys. Either you are walking in the light of Christ, which means either you are walking in repentant faith, or you're not. Either you're walking in the light of repentant faith in Christ, or you're walking in darkness. You know, again, the Old Testament Israelites, either those snake-bitten Israelites came to the bronze serpent, or they didn't. The alternative wasn't good. Jesus himself says, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Everyone who does wicked things 
hates the light, does not come to the light. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it there, does he? He, do, he doesn't leave any wiggle room for special circumstances. Either you're walking in the light of Christ or you're not. And I know it's not too difficult nowadays to see that, hey, boy, we are still being attacked by the deadly serpents of sin, death, and the devil. It's true. I'm not going to argue with you. Nobody is. There is nothing new under the sun. And that also includes the good physician's diagnosis and treatment. Folks, we're still being called to repentance. Okay, We're still being called to stop going in our own dark and sinful direction. Stop telling God how our life's going to be. We're still being called to turn back to Christ, to fix our faithful gaze upon Jesus who came to give us life because we're already dead in our sins. Jesus is the one and only source for life and deliverance. That means that's all the vaccines, all the face masks, all the hand sanitizer in the world, it ain't going to save you. Contrary to what the news is telling you, the CDC can't save you. The false god of government cannot and will not save you. All the doctors and nurses in the world cannot deliver you from the bonds of just one single sin. They may be able to treat the current symptom of sin that's assailing you, but they can't treat the sin. So folks, do not be deceived. You may be able to hide from COVID. You may be able to hide from murder hornets or blizzards or empty shelves at Walmart. You can't hide from sin. You can't hide from the wage of sin. Those deadly serpents of sin, death, and the devil, they're going to find you right where you are. And all the personal protective equipment in the world is not going to be able to save you. That's why our Lord's word and promise is clear. Jesus is the one and only place we are to look to for life, for deliverance, for true peace and assurance. And he's been lifted up on that cross for us and for our salvation. He makes it clear too, doesn't he? Jesus bridges the gap and explains the overlap to us. He says, just as that serpent was lifted up, well, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that ever whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Guys, there is nothing new under the sun. This, the cross of Christ, this is what it's all about. So again, I'll tell you, look around. Look around at the world you live in. And even if COVID does go away, the deadly serpents of sin, that death, and the devil still abound. They're all around you. They've been all around you ever since the fall into sin. And guess what? They will be all around you until Christ returns in all glory and mercifully puts an end to all this. Do not be deceived. You always need Christ. And that's just it. He has promised to ever and always abide with you, to give you life abundantly in him through his word and sacraments, okay? Right through or, or, or through his very word and promise of life, which he attaches to simple word, water, bread, and wine. Guys, here is Christ, right where he tells you to seek him, right where he tells you to flee to him, to hold fast to him, and to live. Now, I know, you know, are these ordinary, unassuming things um, supernatural in and of themselves? The word, water, bread, and wine. Does pastor have secret magic powers? No. Does our faith add the missing portion of life? You know, as if Christ's gift of life and word and sacrament are kind of incomplete without our addition. You know, God's got to do, God's going to do his part, but we need to add our part. Is that how it is? It doesn't become the body and blood of Christ until you say so? No, no, that's Christ's body and blood, whether you believe it or not. Now, does the rest of the world think that we're foolish, maybe even offensive for believing such things, for fleeing to such things? Absolutely. Many a good Christian wanted to cancel these gifts of Christ. Basically, they wanted to cancel Emmanuel. Because all they saw was a potential super spreader. But guys, this is God's eternal word and promise of life, salvation, and forgiveness. This is the very word of God made flesh and hung on a cross to die for the whole world. The very word made flesh who continues to abide with us this very day so that all may look upon him with the eyes of faith right here in the midst of death and have life. 
And that's how we end, guys. May you ever be found by God to be walking in repentant faith. That is, may you ever listen to, look to, flee to, and hold fast to your Emmanuel, your Lord of life who's right here in your very midst. To him be all the glory, praise, and honor. Amen.